unfortunately and, and painfully, the, the Argentinian church wasn't prophetic, in, at, like many other churches in, in Latin America. I think that is in part because the Argentinian situation was different and the, the Argentinian uh, bishops uh, were part of that Argentinian elite. When revolutionary movements swept across Latin America in the second half of the 20th century, the Catholic Church was caught in the middle. In Argentina, a right-wing military government with connections to the church seized power and then kidnapped and tortured thousands. Sociologist and Argentine Jesuit Gustavo Morello has carefully studied his country's dirty war. So what did it mean to be Catholic amidst the chaos? Find out in The Catholic Church and Argentina's Dirty War, today on Subject Matters. Gustavo, thanks a lot for being on the show with us today. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Sebastian. At the center of your book are an American priest and five seminarians uh, of the missionaries of La Salette. And uh, they were living in a formation house mm -hmm. in Cordoba, mm -hmm. Argentina. An American nun was visiting them at the mm -hmm. time. It was August 3rd, 1976. And then in an instant, their lives were changed. What yeah. happened that night? So that night, 40 years ago, yeah. this is a 40 years anniversary, uh, a mob of the state police broke into the house. They were, they pretend to be a guerrilla faction, Montoneros, um, getting into the house uh, to make a revolutionary justice, meaning that the guys were supposed to be revolutionary fighters that have uh, betrayed the organization at some point, but they were the police. Uh, they broke into the house. They, first when they arrived, it was, Joan McCarthy, the nun, was knitting a scarf in front of the fireplace. It was it's winter in the, in the southern corn in, the, in those years, very cold. Um, one guy, a Chilean seminarian, was writing something. Weeks was taking a nap. Um, and the other seminarians were arriving. And while they were arriving, they were uh, subdued, they were tied, they were uh, tortured to some extent, beaten. Um, at the end of the night, the mob had destroyed the house, had taken books, uh, records, old radio, they have broken the bathroom, they have taken the dollars or the Argentinian pesos that they have. They've got into the chapel and they, they desecrated the chapel. They mock, uh, you know, like they dance with the, with the cassocks and the stalls and those things. They, they steal some of the, they, they spread the books on the, on the floor of the chapel. They wrote an svastika in the, in the walls of the chapel, and they destroyed a picture of Carlos Mujica, a priest that had been killed uh, a couple of uh, years ago in 1974. So the guys were taken, they have no idea where they were going, they were blindfolded, put in a car, in the backseat of the car, and just taken to what they thought was, their, they, they, were, they were going to kill them. So they, they were talking about digging a hole and those kind of things. McCarthy was left. Um, G has been in Latin America for a couple of years, but just one year before in Argentina. Um, her Spanish was as broken as, as my English. <laughs> and it was very difficult for her when the mob came to be able to speak current, coherently in Spanish. So they left her thinking that she was nuts. Uh, but she was very clever at that point. She went to uh, a religious house that was nearby there, and from there to the bishop's office. And then she started the, the raid to, uh, the, the, the path to uh, get them free again. Mm -hmm. So I think that that night it was, for some of them, was a journey to darkness. For McCarthy was a kind of uh, seeking for the light in, that, in the midst of that uh, darkness, you know. Yeah. So it was a, a, a started a, a race against time. It's an extraordinary story, but um, uh, not an isolated case. Uh, at that time, it was happening quite regularly. It was only a few months earlier that a military junta seized power in Argentina. And what was really interesting to me, and you point this out in the book, that there was, there was very little public resistance. Uh, the general public sort of went along with it. So what was the socio-political 
you know, situation at the time that allowed for a military government to just seize power and begin their work? So I think that um, the big framework was the Cold War. Uh, in the case of Argentina, 1974, 1973, Perón has came back from exile in, in, in Spain. Um, he won the election in 1973, but he passed away in 1974. Um, her, his wife, is, uh, Martinez de Perón, she couldn't handle the political chaos. She has no political uh, training at all. Um, and and, and she, she couldn't handle the pressures that was at that moment among some guerrilla groups who were, who were complaining about the betrayal of Perón. Some Peronist group who wanted to uh, complete their time at, at the government. And the military that was very uneasy with the whole situation. Um, guerrillas group started to fight in the country uh, against the, the constitutional government. The answer of the constitutional go government was state terrorism. So there were death squads run by Lopez Rega, one of the key ministers in Peron cabinet, who started to kill the opposition uh, openly. Uh, the difference was that the, 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 the bodies appear on the street. You know, So before the military coup, 1,500 people have been killed, either by the guerrillas or by the paramilitary groups. In 1976, before the La Salette priests were kidnapped, uh, they have been killed a bishop in La Rioja with two priests and a lay person. The Palotinian community in Buenos Aires has been massacred by uh, two priests and three, three, uh, three priests and two seminarians have been killed. Um, uh, people working in the slum of Bajo Flores, like 11 people have been killed there. So there were already uh, things were, were getting uh, much more difficult and, and darker than before. He point out in the book that I think 90% of the population was Catholic in 1976, which is very interesting. Uh, and so this whole question of the pluralization of Catholicism uh, comes up because you have Catholics, you know, fighting against Catholics, Catholics interrogating, kidnapping, torturing other Catholics. And in your analysis of this, you break down these different groups of Catholics into three categories. So just explain to us the three, ca the three categories, the three kind of protagonists of this, yeah. of this period of history. Um, and, and I think that's, that's uh, what you said is also important is in that period of history. I'm not saying that they are the only three groups that are in Argentina or they are, not, uh, they are still there now, but I think that there are those three, th those were the most important three groups in, in, in those years. We have on one side the anti-secular Catholics, a group of people, not necessarily, uh, not only priests, they were bishops, they were lay persons uh, involved in that, who thought that the change that brought about Second Vatican Council, like 10 years before, in, in 1966, 1965, and the situation in the country won't be solved without a strong government that would take back the country to a kind of mythical age. They were thinking about like the medieval times, and it, it, I mean, if you think about that, it's almost ridiculous. We, we didn't have medieval times in, in Latin America at all. Right. So going back to something that haven't exist, uh, but they didn't want an strong government where the Catholic rule was imposed uh, to everyone, to some extent, like uh, Franco, Francisco Franco in Spain in those years. So they were, they were dreaming with that kind of country. For that reason, they didn't engage in any negotiation with modernity. They didn't uh, engage in any negotiation with, with life, with the cultural life. They just went for a plain rejection of anything that has to do with modernity. They call that communism. And if you read their stuff, it's like they were anti-communist. But what, does it, what did it mean communism for them? Lutheran Reformation, modern democracy, British Parliament, Jimmy Carter. So and every even Catholics who were living in the barrios or living in the slums, working with the Paul poor the people. Paul VI was very suspicious. Well, they, they, sus they were very suspicious about right. Paul VI. So uh, fellow Catholics who were doing different stuff, uh, working with the poor, engaged with communities, working with the students, everyone who wasn't with, with them were uh, communists. Then we have this other group of committed Catholics, so people who thought that the way of answering the challenge of the Second Vatican Council and the sign of the times in Argentina in those years were commit with the people. They weren't necessarily progressive Catholics. For that reason, I avoid the idea of progressive because many of them weren't uh, theologically progressive. They were conservative, classic Catholics, if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, but they wanted to be closer to the people. They were engaged with the people and they were trying to walk with the people. And that was their, their main concern. And then we have a third group that I call institutional Catholics 
that again, it's not just the bishops, uh, they were priests, they were nuns, they were lay committed people, uh, lay Catholics who I can uh, name institutional Catholics, that to one extent, to one extent, they, they didn't want to break with the state. They, they want to engage in a dialogue with the state. They didn't want to marry, it with the, to marry the state as the anti-seculars did. They want to have some distance with the state, but they want to walk uh, with the state. They, they have a kind of sense of accountability that they were the representatives of the Argentinian society. They, they understand themselves as uh, the voice of the civil society. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, they wanted to have a kind of pair-to-pair uh, -pair conversation with the state. On the other side, they didn't acknowledge that there were other actors in the civil society in Argentina. They, uh, they, they assumed that they were the whole civil society. For that reason, for them, it was very hard to understand um, the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, for example, of the abuelas when they came. They, they, said, okay, they were the, the mothers, the grandmothers of people of who had been disappeared, disappeared who just yeah. were vanished because... People who were banished. And uh, one more thing about the institutional Catholics is that uh, for the committed Catholics, the problem with the institutional ones, is that they didn't recognize the committed Catholics are real Catholics. And that was the, the big pain that I found when I interviewed the people. That's a really important point. We're going to get to that in a bit. We have to take a quick break. But uh, when we come back, much more of this very complex but fascinating look at a dark period in Argentine history. Don't go anywhere. Father Gustavo Morello is assistant professor of sociology at Boston College, but completed his own studies in Jesuit formation in his home country of Argentina shortly after the Dirty War. His interest in that topic developed from a love of the social sciences and the perplexing question of how and why many good Catholics were silent in the face of state terrorism. Much of his professional work since has focused on the relationship between religion and political violence. The Catholic Church in Argentina's Dirty War is published by Oxford University Press and is available for purchase at Ben McNally Books in Toronto. The junta saw its atrocities as if they were natural, and with such a religious conviction, the cruelties committed didn't seem contradictory to their Christian rhetoric. They weren't hypocrites. They were convinced that they were fighting a war beyond mere good and evil, with a moral superiority that exempted them from common ethical values. Here with Gustavo Morello discussing his book, The Catholic Church in Argentina's Dirty War, and as you were doing your research, you had the opportunity to interview some of the former seminarians who were actually kidnapped uh, that night in August of 1976, uh, who were then detained and tortured for a period of two months. When you were interviewing them and they were looking back now at the situation, how did, how did they interpret what happened? How did they feel about what happened? Um, it was a very moving experience for me. Um, I was doing my dissertation in sociology and I introduced like that. I said, okay, I'm doing this research for sociology. But I'm also a Catholic priest, I'm a Jesuit priest. So I, I, I didn't hide that for them, from them. So I told them, okay, I'm a priest doing this. And in many cases, I found at the end of the interview that I was the first priest, the first church official who asked them what had happened. And I think that that interview for many of them was very, was a healing experience in the sense that they could talk officially to someone that officially listened to them. Mm. Um, the interviews were, were hard, uh, they, they, they were very emotional at some point. They were very grateful that someone had asked the story uh, about what happened. Um, and for me, it was, uh, was very moving. And also, the, some of them has a, had a reading that is uh, of the sense of God's providence in their time in, in prison and when they were tortured, a faith that for me was, was shocking. I mean, I, I don't think I have that faith, you know, like in the middle of the torture, the torture, you can still think about uh, God protecting you, what, uh, like in some of the cases here. So it was very moving for all of us, I guess, the, the interviews. And uh, as part of your research, what you also had to do, which is a very interesting part of the book, is try to give a voice to the torturers themselves. To yes. try to look at them and say, even though I don't think you had the chance to interview any of the people who were directly involved, but to say, 
how did they look at what was happening, what yes. they were doing? So what it, did you discover there? It, it was very difficult. I, I tried to. I, I, I General Menendez is like the big figure of repression in Cordoba. I tried to contact him. His um, uh, attorney said he didn't want to talk, so I, I just couldn't go forward. Um, so I have a methodological problem that is similar to the people who are studying uh, domestic abuse, you know, or domestic violence. We have the voice of the women who talk about that happen. But usually we don't listen the voice of the males, the perpetrators of the violence, mm -hmm. either because they don't, seem th they don't see themselves as perpetrators of anything wrong or because they are fearful of the, of the court and of the judge. So in order to replace the military voice, I went to the documents. In those years, uh, the Argentinian church, and because one of the priests was an American, there were a lot of documents bec between the Argentinian church and the military in Argentina, and also between the military and the US State Department. So I could um, reveal the voice of the military through that way. There are also some statements of other military, not about the case, but, but in general. Mm -hmm. So that was my way of, of exploring that voice that was means at some point in my research. We mentioned the, uh, the third group, the institutional uh, Catholics, who play a very interesting role in this whole history because they are interpreted as being, for the most part, silent, uh, at least publicly. Uh, there were many bishops, probably mm -hmm. most of the bishops uh, mm -hmm. in Argentina at the time would, would fall into that group. Um, and they're criticized for that, I mean, for not uniting their voices publicly to try to stand up for these abuses and human rights. Uh, why do you think that they were not able to speak? I think there are many reasons, uh, but perhaps the most, uh, the most general one is that they were the Argentinian church and they behave in the same way that many other Argentinian institutions. You don't have a voice from the political parties. You didn't hear anything from the unions. The main press, the media, were all aligned with the power. So the peers of the leadership, of the Argentinian leadership, the rest of the country's leadership, the elites, were silent. They didn't, they didn't know what to do because some of them were sympathizers of the military, like anti-secular uh, leadership. Some of them didn't even thought that it was real state terrorism. For many, the explanation, the most plausible ex explanation was that they were um, weird people, you know, like, like collateral damage. Mm. People who were working by their own, but it wasn't what the military wanted. Even the Communist Party didn't criticize the military regime in Argentina. Um, so, I think that uh, is, it, it wasn't a prophetic voice, unfortunately, and, and painfully, the, the Argentinian church wasn't prophetic, in, at, like many other churches in, in Latin America. I think that is in part because the Argentinian situation was different, and the, the Argentinian uh, bishops uh, were part of that Argentinian elite. So, I think that they weren't heroic, but they were... Uh, they, they didn't betray their people, but they were part of the Argentinian establishment. As always, we have a peer review for the show today. Julia Young is a professor at the Catholic University of America. Julia. Scholars of Argentine history are still trying to study and understand exactly what happened during the Dirty War. One question that is particularly interesting is that of the role of Catholics and the Catholic Church. In Argentina in the 1970s, some 90% of Argentines were Catholic, which meant that during the Dirty War, there were Catholic perpetrators, witnesses, and victims of this campaign in this campaign of state repression. Gustavo Morello's book, The Catholic Church and Argentina's Dirty War, helps to clarify the role that Catholics played by examining the history of the kidnapping and detention of these members of the La Salette order. By telling their dramatic story using historical sources such as archival material, interviews, and memoirs, Morello places the La Salettes and Argentine Catholics within the larger story of Argentina's dirty war. One of his major contributions is to divide Argentine Catholics into three groups. The first of these are anti-secular Catholics. The second group is institutional Catholics. The third and final group 
Morello labels committed Catholics. By deploying these categories to describe how Catholics responded to and participated in the Dirty War, Morello offers us a new way to understand the role of the Catholic Church during the Dirty War. He also helps us to understand what it meant to be Catholic in Argentina during this period. In your book, you categorize Argentine Catholics during the Dirty War as belonging to three groups, anti-secular Catholics, institutional Catholics, and committed Catholics. Into which group would you place Jorge Bergoglio, now Pope Francis I, and why? Okay, thanks, Julia. Well, the question that everybody has on yes. their mind yes. when we're talking about this subject, uh, where does Jorge Mario Bergoglio fit into all of this? I think that uh, uh, he's something in between uh, institutional Catholics and committed Catholics. Uh, I think he's, uh, he was an institutional Catholic in those, in those years, mainly because his role as, as provincial of the Jesuits. Uh, he wasn't bishop as yet. He wasn't bishop, right. he was a provincial, uh, Jesuit provincial, who is not like a big figure in Argentinian uh, church right. politics. Um, and he was trying to take care of, of his own people. So he was trying to protect the Jesuits from the uh, the social violence that was going on in the country in those years. So in that sense, I think he plays like more the institutional role. Okay, we are not going to be public, we are going to keep it quiet, we are going to uh, retreat to some extent from the public sphere and, and keep the things within us. But I say between uh, that and committed because um, the idea of working for the people, that sh we should be serving the people, attending the poor, was already there. And that was a kind of, of characteristic of, of many Argentinian priests in those years. So I would say that if I have to do a research about him, I probably will end up putting him at, at some point between the institution and the committed Catholics. Now that he's been Pope for some years, do you see anything in his pontificate that you could say stemmed from his experience of those years about what he what he might have gone through as provincial and then later trying to kind of pick up the pieces when he was bishop. I think that Are the sense themes? yeah, I think that the sense perhaps of the internal pluralization of the church that being catholic uh, is means a conversion in some point like a, a unity in some point but with diversity in other points. So there is no just one good way of being a Catholic. I mean, the only good way is following Jesus, and we have many path, path and many ways to follow Jesus. And I think that that's perhaps the main uh, learning that he, he took from those years in Argentina. We Argentinians learn in the hard way that uh, we should be able to have a Catholic identity open enough to welcome different ways of being Catholic. And I think that you can see that in, in Pope uh, Francis' uh, actions now. All right, we have to take one more quick break, but when we come back, some concluding remarks from Father Gustavo Morello. When I got out, said Alfredo, I went to see the Cardinal with my superior. And the Cardinal received me and said, well, they didn't take you for nothing. They took you because you did something. So I said to my superior, let's go. I didn't answer the cardinal, I left. I felt that the church did not stand with me. I mean the hierarchy of the church. In chapter seven, uh, you document the very valiant effort by Father Weeks, by a number of American mm -hmm. politicians and uh, the local superior, I think, of the Las Salette mm -hmm. uh, seminarians uh, in trying to attain their release. And um, it's, it's a remarkable story, but I was wondering as I was reading that chapter, what about you know, the thousands of other people who were kidnapped, who were tortured, who didn't have those kinds of people working for them? I mean, where do their stories end? Well, they, they are part of the disappear in Argentina, unfortunately. No? There are at least um, 10,000 people who were disappeared. Um, as I mentioned before, 1,500 people were killed uh, for paramilitary groups. The military, when they finished the, their, their tenure, they acknowledged uh, like 3,000 killings, like open killings. Uh, like they, they, they pretend that there were fights with the guerrillas, but always the guerrillas died, never a soldier or a police died. Uh, so at the end, at least 15,000 people were killed or disappeared in Argentina's civil war, in this, in this war. Um, there are some people who put the figure in 30,000 disappear. I, 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 my registers 
sum up till 15,000 people disappear. However, if you compare in Argentinian population, uh, 10,000 killed in Argentina in those years, it's the same as, as an American people die in the Vietnam War. So in proportion of inhabitants, the yes. impact of the disappear is as much as the Americans who died in the Vietnam War. Just very quickly as a concluding question, you know, there's a great irony at the heart of this period of history, and that is you have Catholics kidnapping, torturing, killing Catholics for doing Catholic things. Uh, yeah. You know, none of the seminarians were militant, for example, that you no. talk about. Um, what do we learn, or what did you learn in this research about what it means to be Catholic? I think that you have to be open to criticism uh, as a Catholic. Uh, you have to be open to the chance, the possibility that there is other ways of being Catholic that uh, are different than yours. For the anti-secular Catholics, that was impossible. They couldn't believe that. Uh, it, there wasn't an honest way of being Catholic different than theirs. If you were a different Catholic, you weren't a true Catholic. And for me, that was a call to be attentive to uh, other ways of engaging with God, to also be critical in the ways in which politics and religion mingle. Uh, it's, it's not a good marriage. Uh, I think that we have to be very critical about uh, the links of religion and politics. And mainly nowadays that we talk a lot about that, uh, thinking about Muslims and, and Islam, where we Christians are not alien to that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very attentive to um, distinguish what are a religious call and what can be a political call. Father Gustavo, thanks very much for being here. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you. The book is The Catholic Church and Argentina's Dirty War by Father Gustavo Morello. He's an assistant professor of sociology at Boston College. You can get the book right here at Ben McNally Books in Toronto or from our friends at Oxford University Press. Just visit OUP.com. I want to thank Professor Julia Young for her review of the book today. She's a professor at the Catholic University of America and she's the author of Mexican Exodus, Emigrants, Exiles, and Refugees of the Cristero War, also available from Oxford University Press. And remember, if you want to see my video review of the Catholic Church in Argentina's Dirty War, you can find that and much more on our website. Just visit saltandlighttv.org slash subject matters. That's all for this episode. We'll see you again next time. Subject Matters with Sebastian Gomes is sponsored by the Cullen family. Our Salt and Light team works hard to bring you quality Catholic programming like Subject Matters. Please consider supporting our mission by making a donation today. Thank you for your generosity, and remember, our hope begins with you.